Okay, good morning, and welcome to Becoming the Complete Player, Advice from the Pros. We are joined by FC Kansas City midfielder Yael Averbush, owner and founder of Beast Mode Soccer, David Copeland-Smith, and renowned strength and conditioning coach Chris Gores. Today we are talking about becoming the complete player, and who better to give this advice than a soccer skills specialist, a professional trainer, and of course, a pro athlete playing at the highest level. We will answer fan questions at the end of the presentation. Send us your questions using the hashtag AskThePros on Twitter. This group of all-stars will also be working directly with athletes at our soccer training camp with Michelle Akers this summer, June 12th through the 14th. Make sure to sign up at AmplifiedSoccerAthlete.com slash camp. Thank you again for joining us today, and we'll be with introductions. Yeah, L. Averbush is a current professional soccer player with FC Kansas City. She attended the University of North Carolina, where she became a two-time NCAA national champion, and holds the record for most consecutive starts in the history of the program. Yael has played at all youth levels of the national team system and has also appeared 26 times for the U.S. Women's National Team. In her six years as a professional player, she's played on teams all around the United States and the world, including teams in Russia, Sweden, and Cyprus. Off the field, Yael captures her playing experiences in writing and also works with youth players on and off the field, empowering them to own their personal journeys. Discover more at yaelaverbush.com. Yael, first question goes to you. What does the complete player look like? Um, well, hi, first of all. Thanks for having me on here. Um, I think this is going to be a really fun discussion. I think that when I was thinking about this earlier, when I saw the topic of the Hangout, I think that there's a few elements that go into this. And first and foremost, I think the complete player has to be someone who watches the game of soccer and has an idea and a vision of what the game should look like um, at the highest level. And I think then to become a complete player, you need to have the technical and physical skills and also the mental skills to be able to carry out that vision, um, that vision of the game. So I definitely think it's, um, there are multiple components, but really having all the tools to carry out the vision of what you hopefully watch on TV all the time. Okay, thank you. Um, and on to man behind Beast Mode Soccer. David Copeland-Smith is an internationally recognized as a leading figure in individual technical development. David is seen as a long-term thinker and visionary, determined to bestow a phenomenal work ethic on the next generation of soccer players. David has continued to grow Beast Mode Soccer into the go-to technical training system trusted by prominent players of the U.S. men's and women's national teams, Major League Soccer, English Premier League, National Women's Soccer League, and countless leagues in Europe. The creation of a training culture that has attracted the likes of countless collegiate, professional, and international players such as Alex Morgan, Landon Donovan, and Ali Riley, and the publication of an award-winning at-home training guide to direct players with their technical development while they're on their own. Train like Beast Mode Soccer athletes at BeastModeSoccer.com. Dave, same question. What does the complete player look like to you? Um, hello, everyone. Um, the complete player is its just basically a continuation of what Yale said. Is the First of all, is you, you've got, you're going to be a soccer fan. Um, and I always equate this to, to basketball over here. Because if you, if you go to pretty much any pickup basketball game in whatever city you're in, they'll be able to tell you Kobe's shooting percentage um, or whatever town you're in, you know, the star in that town because they, they invest in it and they watch it. Um, you know, you go to <coughs> a field where there's youth soccer being played and, you know, hey, did you did you watch the games last night? And 90% will say no, but that 10% who do watch, you can tell that they're watching by their movements and how they read the game in their actual games. Um, obviously, there's, there's so many elements to a total soccer player that we use six um, predominantly we work on the technical aspect the mental aspect um, obviously we've got Chris here today who works on the physical aspect and what Chris is actually really really good at is position specific um, physical stuff um, and there's also your lifestyle and social um, and tactical. So it's basically 
a lot of sacrifice for your long-term goals of becoming that complete player, and it's you sacrifice a lot. If you if you truly if you look at someone like Yale, um, I guarantee she missed out on so much that normal teenage girls do when she was growing up. That you know she made that decision because she she had a goal. She knows that what she wanted to be. She wanted to be a complete player, right? So whether that means missing prom, like I worked with a girl yesterday. She's missing prom. Because she's going to PDA, you know, it's like little tiny things like that. That will that will help you on the road to become a complete player. I'm going to stop talking because I do a lot of it, and uh, let you move on to Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, okay, so last but certainly not least, Chris Gores is a strength and conditioning coach and personal trainer, and has functional movement screen and athletes performance mentorship phase one and two certifications. As a personal trainer, he uses that passion to help athletes achieve and exceed their individual goals. With a focus on proper technique and movement quality, he has been able to help athletes of all levels. He has experience training kids with special needs, youth athletes, high school athletes, post-surgery rehab clients, and even professional athletes. He has worked with members of the U.S. Women's National Team and pro players including Allie Krieger and Ashlyn Yael. In the 2012 offseason, Chris joined the Washington Redskins as a strength and conditioning specialist. He also spent time with Sporting Portugal. Get resources and trips and tips from Chris at trainergorez.com. Chris, same question to you. What is the complete player? Well, good morning, everybody, and I apologize if there's any background noise. I'm, I'm in the middle of the, the largest or the loudest Starbucks I've ever been in. But... Um, <laughs> For me, there, there are four things when I look at the performance of a player. Uh, I look at, number one, the mindset. Uh, does this player have the right mindset? Are they, are they tough enough? Do they have the desire to be great? Do they have the desire to, to you know, pursue um, whatever it takes to get themselves or to, to be a better player? Um, number two is going to be the performance on the field, the way that they move, um, the way that they prepare to, move, prepare to move, the way that they can sprint on the field and, you know, if they can, if they can do everything that the game demands them to, to do. Um, the third thing I look at is uh, the nutrition aspect of it. Are they, are they eating the right things? Are they fueling their body the right way to prepare themselves again to perform at the, at the optimal level? And then the number fourth thing I look at is, is the rest. Um, you know, are, are they going to sleep at night? Are they doing the things after a workout or after a game to, to kind of get themselves to recover better? So those are the four things that I look at that make a complete play. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, and now we'll take it to some in individual questions. Yael, how often would you say you, you train on your own, um, both in season and in the off season? Yeah, well, for me at this point, um, in the season, I don't do a ton of extra training on my own just because our season in the end of USL is packed into you know six months, so we have a ton of games and travel, and I actually have to kind of force myself not to overdo it at times because you know in my mind I always have this long checklist of the things I want to improve at and the things I would love to stay after and go early to training to do, but I really try to limit it to um, staying after training a little bit to work on some free kicks, uh, making sure I. Mostly the training I do on my own in season is taking care of my body um, and making sure I'm getting enough recovery to be able to feel good in the games and utilize whatever I've worked on during the week. Um, so I definitely limit myself in season, but in the off season um, I'm training on my own every single day and most days um, it's more than one time a day. So this past off season actually, and I have to say um, a lot of it was due to uh, Chris's help. I, I pretty much trained harder than I have trained um, in my whole life. I would every morning go play small-sided um, and do some technical work with a group of players that so was excellent. Sometimes we'd even have games of 6v6, 7v7. Um, and then most days, at least three times a week, I'd head straight to the gym to meet Chris and we'd do an hour's worth of pretty much whatever my body needed that day. And Chris is awesome at being able to look and say, you know, it's my goal to be faster and more explosive and really get stronger, but some days I'd come in there and Chris would say, whoa, I can tell by your movements today we need to, you know, scale back a little and do this. Um, so I, I entrusted my physical development to Chris in the offseason. And then on top of that, um, most evenings I would do a little extra fitness, um, and I had a, a great 
person named Chris Ward in the DC area helping me with a fitness program. So sometimes I, I even overdid it a little. Um, but for me, you know, the off season is really my time where I love to target and just go after my own personal development. I still see as a player, you know, I'm 28, so I'm not a young player anymore, but I still see there are a ton of areas in which I want to be better, more effective, um, get better physically. So for me, the off season is a fun time to kind of start working through that puzzle and figuring out how to do it. Yeah, wow, and, and every day is a lot, and I think um, definitely overwhelming to some of the athletes that are out there training on their own. So just for them, what, what motivates you, and how do you, how do you wake up every morning and say, I know I'm going to go train today? Yeah, well, my situation is a little bit unique because in the off-season, I don't have any team training. So for somebody who has a couple days a week with a team, maybe two or three days a week with your team, and a game on the weekend, it doesn't need to be um, hours and hours every single day. I think, though, that for me, what I like to do is find the things I enjoy doing. I don't ever go out and do things I hate. Um, I just think that's not, maybe you can do that for one off season or a few months, but you're not going to continue throughout your whole life doing things you hate doing. So I find the things I really love working on, the things I like to do with the ball, I put on my uh, iPod and go out there and, you know, listen to music, kick the ball against the wall, work on all the footwork stuff that you see that they do with Beast Mode Soccer, steal some of their drills sometimes. Um, and I think that finding the things you enjoy doing that don't take a ton of time, you know, you can get better technically doing 15 minutes extra every day. Um, so for me, it's about finding those little things that I find fun that I can track my improvement in. So I think that I just recommend players find what they enjoy. Um, and obviously some of it isn't, um, you know, there's some hard physical work that needs to be done that's not going to feel good at the time. But uh, what makes it all worth it is when you step on the field for a game and you feel like, wow, this really paid off. I feel great today. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. And Dave, um, what specific differences do you notice in players who put in extra time, like Yael, outside of their regular season um, soccer practice and games? Um, I mean, the obvious one is they're, they're technically better, right? Um, but the main one is the psychological aspect. Um, yeah, with the players that we work with, we like them, you know, to do 45 to 60 minutes technical work and that's not you know just footwork it's like Yale said like it could be hand free kicks it could be practicing your long balls your first touch etc um, and if you know if you if you do 45 to 60 minutes every day it's so for in Yale's um, circumstance they have a long off season so if you do that every day and you know because you see other players aren't doing as much. The psychological aspect is that you, I don't like using the word confidence because it's so generic, but you, you, your confidence does grow. Okay, so, you know, eventually you'll see it in practice. And then there's this one eureka moment, the, whether the ball's coming to you in a game or you make a pass that, you, you know, two, three months ago you would have never made, and it comes off because of your hours and hours of grinding that exact moment, then it's like, boom, eureka. And it's keeping that relentless pursuit of excellence going then. Because excellence is, is just as contagious as laziness. Um, and what you'll find is, if it's like, yeah, if you, if you have got a small group around you and one player is working really hard, especially at that level, other players start to notice, well, I need to work harder. And then as a team unit, your confidence is growing as well. So what we refer to a lot is the domination mindset, and that's our players' goals, is we're working hard now so that on the field, you there's no doubt anymore. You know, a lot of players, especially youth players, they don't even want the ball because they're not confident. So they find themselves hiding. Our players... They're screaming for the ball. They want that ball. They want that ball pinged at them at a ridiculous height and angle. They want to receive a terrible pass because they're not even thinking about it because they've practiced that over and over and over again. So your terrible pass turns into their great first touch. So it's basically like you, you put in that extra effort. Psychologically, it changes everything. Physically, it changes everything. And, you know, it's not immediate. It's like anything. If I started to play the, learn to play the piano... Today, I'm not going to be great next week. I might be able to play 
um, <coughs> forgot about Dre. I can say that one because I know I can. Did it with Ali Ryan. Um, but in three months, I might be able to put a decent tune together. In six months, we, you know, I could be getting there. In 12 months, I might be actually able to read music. Right? And it's exactly the same with football. It's, it's building blocks. We call it the Lego mentality. It's like you, you get a Lego castle um, and you open the box. It's not a Lego castle. It's nothing. Right? It's just a bunch of blocks. And you start at the bottom and you build the foundation. And eventually, you have this fantastic um, Lego castle. And Chris is chasing one of his three kids will come across and smash the castle and they have to start again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then Chris, so strength and conditioning doesn't mean the same thing in every sport. Um, so for you, what does it mean as it pertains to soccer? What does it look like and how does it differ from other sports? Uh, well, it's not even just different for soccer, but it's actually different for soccer on every level, right? Because as you get into the higher levels, there are no more substitutions. So the, the conditioning has to has to match that, when, whether you're an ECNL player or a high school player or you know college player or a professional player. Um, so it has to kind of match those needs. Um, so the biggest thing that I see with, with soccer is that, um, you know, traditionally what, what coaches have looked at is that the distance covered in the game is about six to seven, maybe even eight miles. And the conditioning has matched those demands because it was eight miles in a game, we need to run eight miles. But if you, if you really take a look at it, if you're looking at a 90-minute game with a 30-minute halftime, that's a two-hour time frame over eight miles. That's four miles per hour. If you hopped on a treadmill right now at four miles per hour, that's not very fast at all. You're not going to win too many 50-50 balls at all. So... When you look at the strength and conditioning, it has to match the demands of the sport of being able to sprint and being able to recover in between sprints so that you can go out there and do it again and do it at a, a terrific pace. And then beyond that, beyond just the single event of the game, if you take a look at the season where sometimes in a week you're playing three games, you, you better have a, a great foundation of strength if you think that you want to play in all three of those games and you want to be able to recover from game one to two or three. Um, you know, that, that strength has to be there for you. Okay, thanks. Um, Yale, with, with you mentioning some of the stuff that you do earlier when you're training on your own, and, and then Chris talking about strength and conditioning, there's a lot of athletes out there who don't have access to facilities to train. Um, so what's your advice to them to still get a workout in and still get touches in on their own? I think one of my favorite things about training is the creative aspect of figuring out ways to get better. And I think that, you know, I, growing up, um, I was really fortunate because both my parents are athletes. They're long-distance runners, and I would see them doing crazy things. And, you know, when it would snow outside in New Jersey, they'd be in the house jump roping and doing their workouts with all kinds of funny equipment. And I think that just instilled in me the idea that no matter what, you're in control of getting better. And if every single day you decide that today I'm going to get better, you'll find a way to do it. So for me, a lot of times that means on a rainy or snowy day when it's miserable outside, I'll go in a parking garage or a racquetball court. Um, I think that, you know, soccer is wonderful because you don't need any fancy equipment. You don't need to buy things. All you really need is your soccer ball. You, need, you can find a brick wall. That can be a great training partner. Um, you know, it can have a parent, sibling, friend, throw you balls to work on uh, your first touch, volleys. Um, so you don't, you don't need any fancy equipment. And even a lot of the stuff I've done with Chris in the weight room, um, you know, we have wonderful facilities to work with, but a lot of it can be done anywhere at any time. All you need is, you know, a bench at a field. Uh, you can use a soccer ball to do a lot of stability work. You can get a basic band and do a ton of um, strengthening. So I think that that's one of the great things as a as a player and like I know Dave talks about owning your development as a player and I'm really big on that too I think that if you decide that you want to be better part of the fun is finding ways to do that and all the information is out there nowadays you know you have YouTube you have all kinds of videos people post people post information about workouts so I think if you do a little research and find out the things that you enjoy with the equipment and um, facilities that you do have, there are definitely ways to make it work, always. Definitely. Okay, so Dave, um, is there one thing that players always come to you with for help? Um, yeah, their feet, footwork. Um, it's, there's, there's, a, there's a glaring hole in um, 
in player development, and it's it's giving players the basics. Um, and you know, you guys can you guys can go to any field and watch high level youth games, and there's there's not many players that will stand out that a have really good feet, B, have really good vision, and C, have the, the, the mental capacity to implement both on the field. Um, so like I've, I've genuinely, I've lost count of how many pro players that we work with and so I wish we had this when we were younger. Um, so it, it's, it's, always, it's always footwork. It's always the 1v1 domination. It's like, uh, how how can I beat players? You know, I've, they, players tend to know all these moves, but they don't know when to use them and how to use them, why they're going to use them. Um, so, I, you know, I, I would I would say footwork. I just wanted to touch on what Yale was talking about as well, like finding places to to practice. That is absolutely no excuse ever. I don't care who you are, where you live. Everybody has a two by two yard box, right? If I if I said to yeah, right, you're gonna live in a two by two yard prison cell for thirty days. Here's a ball. She would make drills up, right? She would get better in that thirty days. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you don't need a, a half a field. You don't need a full size goal. You don't need cones. Everybody's got old socks, right? Or anything laying around the house. You know, a dog is a great defender, right? Like, it, and it, it's, it's, we live in a society where um, we use the word talent as a crutch, right? I, I can't stand the word talent because the players that I work with, who are at the top are not talented. They have absolutely grinded out their skills. And we like to use the word talent because as a society we're lazy. Right? You know, look I look at Yale, I mean, well she's she's so talented. She can hit a long ball like fifty yards on a dime. Yale, why can you hit a long ball fifty yards on a dime? Because you've practiced it over and over and over and over. She didn't just one day wake up and hit a ball and think, oh, that was all right, wasn't it? Better, better do that again. And this, you know, are we born with certain, <coughs> you know, natural ability? Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I said her parents are, are long distance runners. You know, my, my father was a boxer and a squash player. My mum was a swimmer. You know, my brother does triathlons. So we've got, we've got that athletic thing going on but I wasn't born with a ball at my foot you know so we use that word talent almost like a band-aid to make ourselves feel better it's like well you know little Joni there she's just really talented no no whilst you're sat on your butt watching pretty little liars Joni's outside busting her butt hitting a ball against the wall turning doing a little fake and passing the ball into the goal over and over and over again and then we wonder why she's good in the games and then you know we oh she's so talented so obviously like I'm really passionate about the no excuses thing um, because like this is why most of our drills are done in, in a small environment because you know obviously I'm very fortunate we're in Southern California but I'm also very very aware that a lot of our subscribers are on the East Coast where it's snowing and they've only got a basement to use. You know? Basement drills, there you go. You can get better in your basement. Rant over. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. So Chris, as as Yael and um, and Dave both touched on, there's you know, so many different things that you can do um, on the field or off the field to train on your own. So you you know you're oftentimes working in a gym. What can players do um, to get better without necessarily having that equipment? Um, and also, if you can touch on what players come to you for with 
um, for help the most. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll and I'll finish up what David was trying to say with with talent. And it's definitely become an excuse that people have used. Uh, you know, especially with me, they'll say, you know, I, I wish I was as talented as a yeah, or I wish I was as talented as some of these guys in the NFL. But the, the truth is that you know, these guys and you know, and everybody that's at that level. They worked their butts off to get there. They didn't just wake up out of bed one day and say, you know what, I feel like playing soccer for the women's national team. That's not what happens. There's a lot of work that goes into that, and, and talent has, has become an excuse. It's become a convenient excuse for somebody to say, oh, I'll, I'll never be able to do that because I'm not talented enough. When the truth is, I'm never going to do that because I'm not willing to do the work uh, that it takes to get there. And that's that's really the, the honest truth to it. Um, and in, in regards to working out with wall in your basement, you know, it, it's the same thing with strength training. You know, a lot of people come to me because uh, they, they want to take their game to the next level. It's, hey, I, I've become pretty good with the ball, I've become pretty proficient with the ball, but now I'm at a thing. I'm playing at a level up, and the kids are a lot stronger, faster, and bigger than me. How do I get stronger and faster and bigger? And even with the L, it was the same thing. So how do I get her to the point where she can she can work people off of the ball and she can compete for for, for balls that are, you know, 10, 15 yards away, but she's not getting beat. Um, and those things, you can work on that with no equipment at all. You don't need a fancy facility. There are no barbells and dumbbells on the field. So, you know, you can, you can work on some of that stuff in your basement. You can work on that, you know, on the field or, or you know, in, in your house, wherever it is in your backyard. There's, there's plenty of core work that you can do. Um, there, there's plenty of flexibility work that you can do, plyometrics, just... You know, if you, again, that two-by-two two box, if you have that, you have plenty to, to work with. So, um, again, there are no excuses for, for you not to put the work in. Um, that's just something simple that, you know, you, you have to make that choice every day. Are you going to get better or are you going to let everybody else leave you behind? Um, and then, yeah, if you want to get stronger and if you want to get better and you get bigger and faster, then you don't need a, a the fancy... Uh, facility to do that. You can do that in your own home, in your own bedroom. Okay. Well, it's, uh, it seems like a theme of all the answers, that there's definitely no excuse. So everybody should get out there and, and get their training in. Um, and next question. So, Yael, um, what do you think are the biggest challenges and setbacks for players, uh, or that a player faces that keeps them from their full potential? Yeah, I think... Um, when I, when I think about this, I think of two things, really, and I think that they're very much related. And first is that players, I think, often give up. Um, they're told, you are not fast enough, you're not big enough, whatever it is that could potentially hold someone back, they're told that and they believe it. And I think that if you believe it, it's going to be true. Uh, you know, I had a coach tell me when I was about 14 that I wasn't athletic enough to play at the highest level. And at first I cried and I, um, I mean, I thought like, whoa, is he, he's crushing my dream. But then I decided, no, I don't believe him at all. I'm, I'm going to prove him wrong because I think that I can play at the highest level if I do all the things necessary to do that. So I think that that goes hand in hand with, like we were talking about, owning your journey as a player and making decisions and taking control, taking charge to say, here's what I believe about myself. Here's the vision I have of myself at the highest level and I'm going to find a route to get there and I think that at times the route doesn't go as you planned as a player. Would I love to um, have played at this point in a couple Olympics and World Cups? Yeah, like that's what I thought when I was nine that I was going to do. But it doesn't always work that way. On the other hand though, it's in my power as a player and an athlete to say, okay, I see I've played with those players who are doing that. I watch on TV. I see what it looks like. And I'm going to find ways to shape myself as an athlete and get closer to that goal. So I think that that comes down to little things. You know, as a youth player, I was the only girl on a boys team for a while. And since that point, I thought that really helped my development. I've found ways to play with boys, with older girls, with people who are at a higher level than me. I think that really helps. And as, as youth players, you know, it's easy nowadays because there's a lot of programming to just follow, you know, follow the path that you're naturally going to be on. But I think as a player, it takes something special to think outside the box and say, you know what, I'm going to do that extra. I'm going to, maybe I am not the most athletic player. I'm going to find an expert who knows how to help me with that. I'm going to 
look on YouTube and find videos on it. I'm going to read books. I'm going to find the information. And I'm going to make myself the player I want to be. So I think that um, there's not a player out there who doesn't hit a setback at some point, whether it's an injury, not making a team, being told something about yourself um, that tells you, you know, you won't make it. But I think that if you believe that and you let that hold you back, it will hold you back. And if you don't take control of your own journey and find ways to make yourself better, you know, that, you know, that'll hold you back in your career. But um, if you stick with it, you don't give up and you find ways to make it work, I think that you will always find your full potential, whatever that is. Great. Um, so Dave, based on what she said, and um, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier as well, what's with all that in mind, what's the best thing a player can do for themselves in their development? Organization. It's like you, if you if you can get organized, um, and I always I always think about Kristen Press when it comes to organization, because Press is like OCD organized, um, and it's it it's funny, but I actually quite admire it at the same time. So, you know when. When press, and I'm, I'm guessing this is when she was young as well, because OCD doesn't just come on. But you know, she will, she will have a planner, and it will literally be like every hour is is set out. Now, if you're at high school or a middle school, it's easy for you to do this, right? And this is actually in one of our training programs, the Better Soccer Blueprint. It it shows players how to organize themselves, and it's you know, it's like Yale said, if you've got a game, you don't want to be training extra that day. You need your, your body to be fresh. So it's about writing everything down and being like, right, you know, I'm out of school at 2.30. I've got, you know, extracurricular till 3.30, homework till 4.30, right? I can push homework back so I can do three quarters of an hour on my own. And it's writing down exactly what you're going to do. Like we want our players to do this on a, usually on a Sunday evening. They plan their entire week out. Right, and then they're organized. So it's basically, it's your map to success. Right? You ask any successful person, it didn't just happen. They had a plan. And it's executing that plan. Um, and being like, we, we have players, short term goals, long term goals. We have players do daily goals. You know, for me, I've got like, I've got mad ADD. Right, I have to write down my goals every day. So I, I'll wake up and I write, right, what do I want to achieve today? Number two, how am I going to achieve it? At the end of the day, I go back, number three, did you achieve it? If not, why not? If so, what kind of results did you have? Because it's about, it's about results attained, not action put out. Right? Because I can stay busy all day and get nothing achieved. Right? Nothing. Or I can get specific with things. So if I've got, this is a big if, but if I've got a really bad left foot, very, very big if, I've got a terrible left foot. But if I want my left foot to get better, I'm going to write down, right, I'm going to do wall drills on my left foot. I'm going to do two touches left foot, one touch left foot, inside left foot, laces out uh, left foot. I'm going to do short, then I'm going to go longer. And I take it off as I go. I mean, it's not rocket science, is it? But unfortunately, like these days, we've got these things, right? So we've got these cell phones, and everyone really gets distracted by them. And you know, you've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest. You've got all these things to distract you from your goal, right? They're actually put there to to make you fail. Like Yale and I were saying earlier. If you're having such a good time on the beach with your friends, why are you taking two minutes out to take a picture and then write that you're having such a good time? Because my idea of a good time isn't this. But that's not my idea of a good time, right? So if, if we can if we can get players to organize so they know exactly what they're doing when they're doing it, and sometimes things are going to come up, right? Things come up, and that's fine. You learn to deal with it. Um, you know, another one I always refer to is is, is Alex Morgan because you've got a girl here who who has so much going on. But you know, I don't. I, there's not many people that work harder than 
the people in this Google Hangout, and Alex is one of them, and she juggles commercial shoots. She juggles interviews. You know, I've been with training with Al before, and you know, she's on the phone to her agent. She's like, "No, that needs to be pushed back. I haven't finished training yet." And it's again, it's the organisation, right? They've, I've got nine to eleven thirty every day this week, and blacked it out. That's when we train. And it's that organization concept that really helps people succeed. I talk a lot, huh? <laughs> it's, all, it's all good information. And I really like the sticker on the back of your phone, too. <laughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> um, so, Chris, um, Dave talked about organization as, as a big component of what players can do. Um, What's a common theme among athletes you work with uh, who excel in their individual game? Is organization one of them, and what are the other things? Uh, I think organization is definitely uh, something that's a common theme. Uh, no matter what game you play, there's always a game plan. Um, there's always some sort of structure or, or plan of attack that you think is going to, to ultimately lead to success on the field or, or in life. And um, I think that the best people can write that game plan, but can also adjust that game plan on the fly. Because, like Dave said, the things are going to come up that were unanticipated, or maybe even anticipated. Maybe, maybe in your game plan, you have different scenarios, and you've already played out. You know what's going to happen if this goes wrong, if that goes wrong, or in basketball, if I get into foul trouble, or if, if I get a quick yellow card. You know, all of those things have to be played out. Um, and then the other thing that I see with, with all of my athletes on the, high, on the highest level is a certain eagerness to compete. It's not just a willingness to compete. I think John Wooden said it best, the difference between willingness and eagerness. You know, I think it's very easy to separate the good players from the bad. That's about 90%. And then, you know, the top 99%, they're willing to do what it takes. And then that top 1% in the world, they're, they're eager to do what it takes. And they're eager to be challenged, right? I think I think we, we live in a world now where, where everybody gets a trophy and everybody gets a, a medal for participation. And um, kids don't handle adversity very well. They don't handle losing. They don't handle criticism. They don't handle any of that stuff very well. Whereas the top 1%, the, the, the people who are really successful at what they do, whether it be sports or business or in life, they're, they're eager for that. They, they want you to say something to them. They want you to challenge them. They want to compete with you um, on a daily level. So, you know, they wake up. I know one of my one of the athletes that I train is Lorenzo Alexander from the, the Arizona Cardinals. And that guy just loves to compete in anything. Uh, if it's, you know, on the football field or if it's selling Girl Scout cookies, you know, that guy is the fiercest competitor that I know. Um, and it, and it, it's, it's just a daily habit for him. He's, he's eager to compete. He loves it. He looks for challenges, and, and he welcomes that. He doesn't shy away from criticism, or he doesn't shy away from adversity and challenges. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Ali, you, you have an incredibly decorated career, um, winning national titles at championships, um, championships at every level, and spending time with the national team. So one might ask, what part of your game are you still working on, um, and how do you continue to grow and evolve your game? It's been really interesting for me throughout my career because I think, um, you know, as a young player, you kind of think, oh, you become a professional, and then, great, you've accomplished your goal, or maybe you play for the national team, okay, awesome, you've made it. But I think um, what I realize more and more, and I'm still realizing this, is that it's constantly a, you know, these guys talk about being competitive, it's I'm constantly in competition with myself to be better um, than I was yesterday and be better tomorrow than I am today. And I think that the older I get as a player, for some reason, instead of that slowing down, I actually feel it more and more. It's kind of like I've I felt those days in training and in games where I'm like, whoa, this is all paying off and all kind of coming together. And that feeling is so addicting to me that I've become almost obsessed with getting better. And for me, specifically some things, you know, I, unlike um, some of the athletes that maybe Dave has talked about that he meets with, I spend a lot of time as a young player, and I still do, with the ball at my feet, um, mastering various techniques, right and left foot, um, all kinds of ball work. And for me at this point, it's about it's not stopping doing that work, because I love doing that. I'll always do that. But I think finding ways to be more effective um, in the game uh, with those skills and those techniques that I've mastered. So for me, part of that is the physical component like Chris said, being able to get to a ball before someone else or 
Um, and coming into that, there's a lot of elements that go into that. It's one, seeing the game quicker and being smarter. Um, it's also the physical aspect of actually feeling good and being strong. And, you know, maybe I'm never going to be as fast as um, an Alex Morgan or Sydney LaRue. It's just not possible for me. But to be able to run at my max speed still in the 85th minute because I'm, you know, so conditioned and so prepared that whatever my max speed is, I can reproduce that again and again in the game. Um, and being strong enough to hold someone off, or maybe I do have a good first touch, but because I'm a little bit taller as a player, my center of gravity needs to be a little lower. I need to be stronger if I get, you know, if there's physical contact so I can maintain the ball and keep possession. So it's things like that, um, and also positionally finding myself in spaces on the field where I can be dangerous as opposed to just connecting passes and being a connector which I think is one of my strengths. Um, finding myself in areas where I can take shots, where I can combine and try to play a final pass, those things and doing those more and more in games I think um, is kind of the next step for me so I'm working on a lot of those areas and actually kind of in line with this I've been reading um, a book called The Art of Learning by Josh Wadeskin, and he's the guy that the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer was made based on, um, a chess master, and he also became a really wonderful martial artist. Actually, I lied. I'm not actually reading the book. I'm listening to it on audio, on a, as an audio book because <laughs> I'm really, really bad with reading sometimes. But yeah. I'm, I'm um, listening to the book. But something he talks about a lot is... For somebody who's been doing something for a lot of years, which at this point I'm not, you know, I'm not new to the learning process in soccer anymore... Um, he talks about instead of, you know, some people think that to get from th that, that last 1% of your development to really become excellent at what you do as opposed to just very good, um, that you have to add all these qualities and, and add. And he talks about it um, in terms of really just removing obstructions to optimal, optimal performance. So I've thought a lot about that as well, is that, you know, I've put on all these hours and I've felt moments where I feel really good, but in what way can I mentally and physically remove any obstructions I have, maybe fears I have about um, failing or whatever it may be, to be able to bring my optimal performance more often, um, as opposed to just once in a while, how can I every game find myself in a mental and physical state where I can be my absolute best? So I think that for me is something um, I've just started to think about recently in listening to this book as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Dave, all three of you have now touched on you know what it takes to 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 do these things um, to be a great player. Um, you've also said some things that that set you back. Uh, so what's the most common mistake you see players making when it comes to developing into this complete player? They listen to the wrong people. Um, so I've got I've lost count of how many players. The, the problem is that coaches at, at certain levels, like the youth level, they don't realize how powerful their words are. So you know, if a, if a coach turns around and says, well, you're never going to play college, for some reason, p people listen to that. Um, and maybe it's teammates saying it. Um, so they listen to the wrong people instead of just getting on with it and being mentally strong enough to to plug that out. And that, that goes throughout life, right? It's You're, ne you're never going to you're never going to start a company. You're never going to do this. You're never going to do that. Um, luckily, you know, you'll get a participation medal. But it's, you know, players listen to coaches who they trust or other people who tell them they can't do it. Or they listen in the other way. And when coaches tell them, oh, you're amazing, you know, you're a great player, and then they become lazy because they believe their own hype. Right? So it's, it's like there's um, there's uh, there's definitely a balance somewhere where you know the the ones that succeed <coughs> squeeze through that funnel, um, and usually the ones that succeed are the ones who are self motivated and driven. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to to be brought up in a way that, you know, um, was, I was self-reliant. So if I didn't get good at something, it was never the coach's fault, right? It was, it was no one's fault. Well, you didn't work hard enough. 
So I learned from a younger age that if you actually want something, you've got to go out and do it. Um, and if you, you know, if a coach tells you no, you've got three options, right? You can either go, you can believe it, but like, oh, okay. You can get really fired up and try and succeed through anger, which isn't a great way to succeed. Or you can look at them, accept their opinion, and disagree with it. And just a little bit, take it as fuel to work harder and prove them wrong in a positive way. Does that answer that question? Yeah, yes. A little bit. No, that was, that was perfect. Thank you. Um, and changing directions just a little bit, um, Chris, ACL injuries are the most common we see in this sport. Um, what can athletes be doing to help prevent this type of injury? Oof, well, ACL injuries are uh, a huge beast. So even if you did everything exactly right, the way that you were supposed to do it, injuries can still happen. It's just the nature of the competition. It's the nature of the game. Um, you could get tackled. You could get hit. You could land wrong. There's just so many things that could happen within the course of a game or even a competitive practice that could lead to an injury. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things that you can do to at least reduce that risk. So the biggest thing that we focus on is uh, mobility and stability. So if you take a look at uh, you know, the knee, which, which is where the uh, injury happens, you know, the ankle, which is below the knee, and the hips above the knee, they have a, a lot to do with the way that that knee functions and, and the type of stress that you're putting on that knee. So if your ankles aren't flexible, if your hips don't have the type of mobility that they need to have, then your knee has to make up for that, and it usually makes up for that in the, in the course of an ACL tear. Um, so we work on a lot of ankle mobility, hip mobility, and then strength. We have to we have to strengthen what what we have so that uh, we, we can withstand that force. So that when you're when you're planting or when you're changing directions, you have enough strength to come out of that and and, and be healthy. Um, and, and again, that's not just within, not just within the, the course of the game, but the season in general. Through, through, you know, through, through, through the end of the, the, end of the season, season, you're having. You're having three or four games a week and you got competitive practices or maybe you're in two or three different leagues, you know, this you might be dog tired out there and you might be trying to do the things that you know that you, you're used to doing and you just don't have that strength to do it anymore. So we try to build the strength around it, especially the glutes and the hamstrings to help support the knee. Um, but again, th these are all things that are, are preventative measure measures meant to help reduce the risk of injury. And, um, it's always going to be different for each person because each person has different issues that they're dealing with. Um, core strength is another one. If, if you don't have a strong core, then again, your, your knees and everything else that you do has to make up for that deficiency in your movement. So um, it just it just goes to see show you that there's this pattern of mobility and stability that your body needs uh, in certain parts um, to, to be able to function and move well. And that's something that is often ignored in the sport because it's, it's the, the fitness aspect of it is almost valued more than the movement quality aspect of it. It's not necessarily how that, that athlete or that player is moving it or are they able to function well. It's can they just do more? Can they, can they get through this game and, and do this in a certain amount of time? And it ends up happening that you start building fitness and strength on top of a dysfunction, making that dysfunction even worse and then eventually leading to an ACL tear or some other type of injury. So it's a it's a tricky one. Um, I can't say that there's a magic bullet out there that, that is going to prevent anybody from ever tearing their ACL, which there was. Um, but uh, at the same time, there are some, some proven methods that you can start to do, and, and there, there's all kinds of resources that are out there, including on my website, that will give you some direction on how to reduce that risk of injury. Thanks, Chris. And I know that um, that topic alone probably could be an entire hangout, but uh, it was great for the, the insight there. Um, now we'll just move on to talk about the camp a little bit this June with Michelle Akers. Um, so just turning it to Dave, what what should athletes um, attending the camp expect, at least from you? Um, you're you're going to get a map. You're not just coming for a camp. Uh, I'm going to give you a map to succeed way, way, way after camp. You're going to learn... Uh, the funny thing is everybody <laughs> everybody wants wants to know what we do with like oh my gosh what do you do with, with Alex and, and you know press and Abby and all this nothing different than I do with other people right 
So the, the, the biggest thing about Beast Mode Soccer, the biggest secret of Beast Mode Soccer, there is no secret. It's just hard work, right? So we're going to show players how to really focus in on their weaknesses whilst making their strengths stronger. Um, we're going to show players something called mind armor, which is really, really simple techniques um, to have them really, really take over their own head in games, out of games, in practice, um, and learn how to to really control their own environment in games. And it's it's funny what Yale was saying earlier about like what she needs to work on when she's in games and stuff. Um, and we're going to show players how to, because I, I believe that a lot of it is trust. Trust in yourself. If you see something, you just play it, um, which is kind of like symptomatic of um, youth soccer, is that if a player makes a mistake, what happens? They get screamed at and they get subbed off. Right? This is usually what happens, and that's not good for development. So we show players how to deal with that. You know, if you get if you make a mistake and you're getting screamed at, you you're aware that you made a mistake. Have you fixed it in your own head? Yeah, great. So we're gonna give players like the full the full map toward their own success. You know, no matter where you get, where you want to get, I'll show you how to get there. Um, it's going to take a lot of work if you've got high goals. But yeah, that's what they're going to get out of me. Okay. Um, one more question about the camp, and then we'll move on to uh, fan questions. So, uh, yeah, El, you've worked with both Dave and Chris on developing your game. Um, how has that helped you, and why should athletes take advantage of having them together um, in one place at the camp? Yeah, I think, I mean, having the help and input of experts is absolutely vital, I think. Um, Basically, they will share with you all the information you need, like Dave said, and then it's just about executing. So I think that there are a lot of players out there who are, say they're willing to work hard and just want to know what they need to do. <laughs> Basically, you will have information on what you need to do. Um, I think there's also an aspect of you can go out and do a lot of training and spend a lot of time, um, but there needs to be something intentional about your training, I think, to make it to make it really quality. And what you will see from Dave and Chris, because they've worked with extremely high-level athletes, is that they will be able to show you um, the way to train intentionally as if you're a professional player. Maybe your capabilities at this point are not up to that standard, or you would be a professional player. But I think that it's training with the intention and with that and vision in mind. So everything you're doing, you're not just going through the motions of doing a strength exercise or a footwork drill. It's doing it with the quality in mind of you know the most elite level and then you're constantly working towards that vision so I think that these two guys as experts in their fields are able to share with you what the top players do and how they do it so that you can take that home and put in all the work on your own so again they're gonna show basically what you need to do and then it's all that you know all that you need to do is go back and and do the reps and put in the time um, and that's kind of a starting point and then hopefully if you're able to interact with them over time, they can, again, look at what you're doing, see your improvement, and where you need to go from there. Okay, thank you. And now we'll take um, questions from the audience. So um, this one's for Chris. So everybody here has been talking about um, this competitive drive, the eagerness to compete, and the obsession you need to be uh, the complete player. So do you feel like this mindset can be learned, um, or is it something that you have to kind of naturally have to separate the good from the great players? Um, so this is a tricky question as well. It, if you're asking me, can, can you learn to be at the top 1%, there's a certain part of me that will say no. If you have it, you have it. If you don't, you don't. Um, and I know that there are a lot of players out there who wish there might be another answer, but you know, I can't say that everybody is going to be 1% because that's what they are. They're the 1%. So it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. Um, but I think that if you if you can find a connection with what, what it is that you really want, I think it really just comes down to a, a priority and a desire. If you can find out what it is that you really desire and be and be truthful with yourself, what you really want out of sport and what you want out of life. Um, and if you can practice 
overcoming small challenges first, things that are going to kind of get in your way, like your scheduling, like your, you know, doing your chores and your homework so that you can get to practice. If you can come overcome those small things and make it a habit, um, then it starts to be something that becomes a part of you. You know, being the complete player is something that is 24-7. It's not just what happens at practice or what happens in the weight room. It's something that's 24-7. You know, you're, you're going to be somebody that's, uh, again, welcomes those challenges, is eager to overcome those challenges. Um, and, and, again, everything everything that you are, are faced with, you think about that as a, an opportunity to practice overcoming uh, an obstacle. And if you can do that, then, again, it just becomes a habit. And maybe you do, maybe you do get to that point where, you are at that 1% and nothing can stop you. Okay, thank you. The next one's for Dave. Um, what is the next big thing in soccer training? There isn't one. <laughs> there, everything's out there already. Um, you know, as a, as a business owner, I should say the Soccer Vortex, which is dropping June 1st, the most complete individual technical training program ever put together on the face of the planet. But, you know, again, what we're doing is just its just organizing it. Um, we're trying to put, we're not trying to put, I am putting together a program that just, it, it's like a, like a vacuum cleaner of excuses. It's just taking them all out. Um, so no longer will players be like, oh, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't get organized. I didn't know what to eat. I, I was worried about my knees because Chris is, done an ACL strengthening program for us. Um, Yale does great videos. And we're, we're putting all of this together in one training program. Um, you know, it's it, it's not the next, I don't want to lie, it's not the next big thing. There isn't a next big thing. You know, and anyone who tells you different is a liar. There are no secrets. There's no secrets to becoming a good soccer player. Every, everything you need to know, we've we've covered today. Um, you know, every now and then something's going to come out that's really shiny and sparkly, and everyone's like, "Oh, I want that! I want that new soccer ball because it tells me how hard I kick the ball." Does it? Great, because that ball's still not going in the back of the net if you don't hit it right. You know, so it's all it's there is no next big thing apart from the soccer vortex. <laughs> okay, so we should look forward to that in a couple of weeks, right, Dave? June 1st is big, big time drop in June 1st. Okay. Immediate access once you purchase it as well. No waiting. Instant right. gratification. Okay, the soccer vortex. Got it. Um, <laughs> all right, we have time for one more, and uh, we'll, we'll give this one to Yale. Um, as the level of play in the youth game continues to grow in this country, what will be the major difference between those who make it to the pro level and those who do not? I think something I've seen um, that really strikes me is um, players' longevity. And I think that what I've seen throughout my youth um, development and career into now as a professional, um, you know, you see the, the youth star who at U14 is playing up on the U16 national team. And I've seen those players both make it and play professionally, having a great career and be on the national team, and I've seen those players not even be playing soccer five years later. So I think um, for me what struck me is that the players who stick with it and to continue to improve are the ones who make it. So um, it's about you know the long run more than anything. It's not a sprint at a young age to be the best in your age group right away. It's a long-term vision to where you need to go as a player and maybe as a young player there's somebody who doesn't necessarily stand out but who has the vision and puts in all the right work and 10 or 15 years later emerges on the professional scene and you know I've seen it in the NWSL players who I had never heard of on the youth national team scene who went to small colleges and now are starters on their team. And I've heard of, you know, those star players who were the big name growing up and they don't even play or love the sport anymore. So I think it's really about that vision and the longevity to continue to improve over the years. Okay. Well, thanks everybody so much um, for your amazing insights. And I know that um, all the athletes watching and that will watch after because this is available on uh, record right after uh, we're done here. You can watch it at the same link. Um, anyway, so thank you all for your, for your time. I know it's precious to you. So um, 
Walker. You can work with Yael, Dave, and Chris uh, this June uh, 12th through the 14th at our training camp with Michelle Akers, the World Cup champion. Um, register at AmplifiedSoccerAthlete.com slash camp. And of course, don't forget to download the Amplified Soccer Athlete magazine in the app and Google Play stores. Uh, you will see resources um, and great articles from these three here, as well as many, many other uh, great people um, and athletes in the game. So for more information on that, you can go to AmplifiedSoccerAthlete.com slash subscribe. Uh, thank you again to the panel. You guys are amazing. Um, and that's all I have today. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Are we all? Yeah, uh, it's stopping right now. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, you're free to disconnect. I really appreciate the time, and I will be in touch soon. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. See you guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.